it's a good right. converter in that sense. And that's an isolated one right now? Yeah, the high voltage side I'm isolating. Using high okay, okay, stuff. okay. You got it, got it, got it. Thank you, sir. Yeah, welcome. Okay, anyone else would like to share the uh, research area or experience? Okay, no problem. So what is the time now? Almost two thirty-five. Yeah, yeah ma'am, you let me know when we can start. We can start. Abhishek will give an introduction, and then we can start. Okay. 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 And, good afternoon. Uh, do you need the video to be on? Uh, at least once uh, during question and answer session, also we'll do in the recording. At least once your photo can come. That's it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So good afternoon, all. The Department of Electrical Engineering, FRC Rodericks Institute of Technology, Washi, Navi Mumbai, welcomes all participants and speaker, Dr. Dipankar Devnath, to the 11th session of FDP, DSP implementation of SPB-based upgrade system and battery backup. Dr. Dipankar Devnath joined, IIT, joined the IIT Kharagpur as an assistant professor in the Electrical Engineering Department in 2016. Before joining IIT Kharagpur, he has worked as an assistant professor at IIT Indore and as research associate at IIT Bombay, both at the electrical engineering department. He was conferred with PhD degree and an excellence in PhD thesis work from the Indian Institute of Technology Bombay in 2015 for studies in power electronics and power system. He has done his ME from IIEST Shivpur, West Bengal and B from NIT Agartala, Tripura. His research interest includes design of integrated power electronic converter topologies, design of solar photo, uh, photovoltaic based standalone upgrade systems for rural area, areas, multifunctional inverter for grid integration of renewable energy sources, the study of microgrid, motor and motor controller design for an electrical vehicle. Now I request sir uh, to start the session. Over to you sir. Thank you sir. Thank you for the nice introduction. and. Thank you for giving me an opportunity to interact with the audience. It is always a pleasure discussing your ideas, your research with like-minded people. So in that sense, uh, I always enjoy this kind of events. And I know how difficult it is to organize such event. It is a lot of work. So I thank again the organizing team. And the topic they wanted me to discuss is this DSP implementation of solar photovoltaic based off-grid system with battery backup. So we did a few schemes on this. Uh, sometime we designed it for catering only DC load. Sometime we did it for AC load. So today I'll just focus on AC load. And more most of this concept that I'm going to discuss is equi equivalent to uh, equally applicable to DC load also. So for the first one hour roughly, I'll, uh, dis I'll discuss about some challenges of this system. And I'm pretty sure if you understand them, uh, from your perspective, you will come up with your own research statement. This area is not very saturated yet. Uh, one of the reason being uh, this kind of system, off-grid system, are mainly required for developing countries or underdeveloped countries, right? So for the researcher in the developed world, they are not much bothered about this kind of problem, which countries like us or the underdeveloped countries are facing. We don't have a grid in each and every corner of the country, right? And as I said, there might be some other countries also who have similar problems. So their extension of grid might be more costly, may not be feasible. So there you can uh, design an off-grid system and you can use benefit of solar, right? Uh, to uh, design such system. And as you know, if we include any renewable energy sources, mostly they need uh, a battery backup to uh, cater their intermittent intermittency kind of uh, problem. So with this, let me go ahead. The plan is that first one hour, as I said, I'll discuss some of the key uh, interesting questions. For example, let's say, if you want to design such system for your own home, how do you calculate how much power you need? 
how do you decide a rating of your converters? Then what are the main component you need if you want to build it from scratch? And what kind of control strategy you want to have in this system, right? So we'll first equip ourselves with these basic questions first. We'll understand the system, overall system. And the later part, I'll, I'll tell you how we can implement such scheme in hardware level. And today we'll focus mostly on how can we implement it in using DSP. So uh, for the DSP, you can take two approach. You can uh, write uh, code in using software like Code Composer Studio. Basically, there you write your C codes and you dump, uh, you configure your register accordingly. Another approach is that you integrate the DSP, whatever hardware you have, to MATLAB. And you do things in MATLAB mostly and dump that code into the DSP. So we are going to take a look at the second approach so that uh, because most of us are very familiar with MATLAB and uh, so we'll learn how we can use the MATLAB to implement, to dump the code to DSP and how you can run this kind of system. I'll also show you some assemble code uh, that we, are, we had written for Code Composer Studio. So later on, uh, maybe we can discuss on this. And just a brief introduction about solar photovoltaic. I believe most of you are very familiar with this, so I did not spend uh, much time or slide on this. Just what some terminology would revise. So as you know, solar photovoltaic, they will take energy from sun and they will give you finally electricity, which as an electrical engineer, we are interested in. So I'm not very interested in how the cells are developed and all, but finally what it is giving me that I'm interested in because I need to design my power electronic converter based on this understanding. So if I take a solar photovoltaic module, so each first it will start with cell level. Individual solar cell can give you a voltage hardly 0.6 volt and current maybe in milliampere. So you connect them in series and parallel to get modules. Then you connect several modules in series and parallel to get solar array, solar panel, and then you connect several of them to get a bigger power plant. So if we talk about solar modules, like let's say I have a, this kind of bigger solar module. So many cells are connected in series and parallel. And if I want to see how their output behavior looks like, so if I consider solar photovoltaic voltage as VPV and the current as IPV. So how this output voltage and current characteristics will look like with respect to uh, time or with respect to any one of them. So this plot is saying that if I vary the output voltage of solar photovoltaic in this fashion, say so zero to a voltage known as VOC, VOC is nothing but open circuit voltage. So what is implying? Simply uh, implying is that I have a solar module. If I keep it open circuit and if I connect a multimeter, I will read VOC. That multimeter, you will get reading of VOC and current definitely will be zero because it is an open circuit condition. Then this point is telling you if you short circuit this. So I'm now short circuiting it. The voltage will have to be zero, but current will be this ISC value. So these two points are well defined. So what about the in-between points? Let us assume that I have a solar panel and I have a battery, a fictitious kind of battery whose voltage I can vary. Yes, yeah, someone is turned on the mic. Can we request everyone to mute, please? Uh, I am muted all. OK, OK, thank you. Yeah, <laughs> this kind of problem happens, no problem. So let us say I, I have a kind of a variable battery, variable voltage battery, and I am varying the voltage from zero to VOC using that battery. So some point it may be having 10 volts, sometime it can have 20 volts, sometime 30 volts, sometime let's say 44 volts or something like that. So at each of this point, the solar will give you this much of current. And at every point of time, if you multiply voltage and current, you are going to get total power that you are getting at the output of solar. So this power versus voltage curve will look like this. And you see there exists a point known as maximum power point, where you can extract maximum power from the solar photovoltaic modular panel. So our objective would be to control our power electronic converter such a way that 
the voltage across this solar photovoltaic module we maintain at this voltage known as vmp right typically there will be around 80% uh, ratio between vmp and voc so we need to uh, write a algorithm known as mppt algorithm which will tell me what is this voltage and once i know my reference voltage i will actually measure the solar photovoltaic voltage and then the error i'll send it to some pi controller and it can give me the duty ratio of the power electronic converter switches so in summary most of the time we would like to operate at this particular point and i want to maintain my voltage at vmp this is a story about only first quadrant remember that where voltage is positive current is positive and solar is acting as a source to you but if you extend this story to other quadrants okay so this was my first quadrant quadrant 1 this is going to be quadrant 2 quadrant 3 quadrant 4 now what if if i connect a solar photovoltaic with a negative polarity battery okay so it was expecting a plus this side minus this side but uh, by due to mistake i connected a battery in the reverse direction so you it will work in reverse direction so here you see your your voltage is negative but current is still positive so what does it mean your power is negative and as a result the solar cell instead of generating power it will consume power and similar case will happen in quadrant 4 also so you would always like to make sure that your system does not go into quadrant 2 and quadrant 4 that you have to ensure when you are designing your power electronic converter so typically what we do we connect a series diode so that no negative current can flow and as a result quadrant 4 you can eliminate and most of the commercial solar module comes with the inherent uh, inbuilt body uh, inbuilt this kind of diode also if you want to prevent any negative voltage what we are going to do we are going to connect a diode like this so one diode like this another diode like this so this diode it don't allow you to have any negative voltage as soon as you apply negative voltage it will turn on and it will make this voltage limited to maybe around 1 volt 1.5 volt depending on the threshold voltage of this diode so this is very important that we ensure proper protect protection in the system before you start designing your converters otherwise you will end up in some problem the next important important question let's say you want to build a 1 kilowatt solar system for your home maybe you have some space in your rooftop or in your yard and you want to design a solar system and you want to design a 1 kilowatt system so how much area you need in your home okay let's try to understand this and sometime i might be going at slightly higher speed sometime i'll be at i'll be uh, going at lower speed if you have any question please stop me then and there and i'll try to address it as soon as possible you need not wait for the last moment if you have any question please stop me in between yeah i think someone again turn on the mic okay thank you right so to understand this we need to understand a term known as standard test condition okay which signifies a condition 1 kilowatt per meter square irradiance level or insulin insulation level basically how much sun is falling at that 1 square meter area now how do you visualize 1 square meter area it is this side 1 meter that side 1 meter this is 1 square meter area and at temperature of 25 degree centigrade if solar irradiance is equivalent to 1 kilowatt so that means 1 kilowatt of solar power is falling on this area this condition is known as standard test condition so you can use this kind of test condition to compare uh, solar module from different manufacturer which one is giving you better efficiency better power so you can always uh, use this kind of a reference operating condition now this condition definitely you won't get during morning or afternoon mostly sometime we'll get during the noon time okay this this is kind of a, one of the best operating condition so let us assume that in one square meter area 1 kilowatt sun is falling so does it imply i will get if i connect electrical load at the output i will get 1 kilowatt power no reason is solar module has efficiency in the range of around 10 to 20% typically uh, let's say 15% commercially low cost uh, whatever solution you are having 
so now basically at the output you will be connecting some power electronic converter etc and also you know 1 kilowatt irradiance is irradiance is not going to be there throughout entire day so roughly just a rule of thumb let us take 10% efficiency figure considering all those factor efficiency of your power electronic converter then irradiance variation etc just to get an idea so finally if i take 10% efficiency the output actually available is 100 watt right so what does it imply if i want to get this much of power i need one square meter area so if i want to get finally 1 kilowatt output power this is very important at the output what is finally i am able to get right it is not what solar equivalent power so roughly this is a thumb rule to get 1 kilowatt of power you need roughly 10 square meter area so now you can get an understanding in your yard or rooftop whether you have enough space or not of course if you buy a higher efficient solar cell you can get a uh, you can reduce the area but roughly this is how a uh, ball park figure can be arrived next question how do i calculate how much power i need right so what we'll do we'll study whatever equipment we have in our home how much they consume right that you can take up as a homework or uh, just study right so for example if you take different load uh, if you have a microwave oven uh, if you have a iron for your shards etc or clothes then uh, if you have your laptop charger so you know roughly how much power rating they are going to consume okay so from that you will understand what is my power requirement then we will see for how much time we need this equipment that will give me power into time energy requirement so power equipment mostly you will get from the uh, name plate reading of the equipment that you are using right and then you calculate for how long you need it for example induction oven you may need it for 2 hours per day so you will multiply this 2 kilowatt into 2 hour that will give you energy requirement for that oven right fan may be required for 6 to 7 hours and light bulb may be required for 10 to 12 hours so you just calculate based on that you know how much power you want right so i just gave an example Uh, anyway you need not note down anything at this point i'll be sharing you the slides and all this example all this data if you find them useful you can take it from there so i just uh, calculated something let's say i have a 18 watt bulb it requires 4 hour of time and a fan and a, a refrigerator etc so finally let's say i need this much of energy so power into time will give me energy requirement why we are interested in it because finally i have to get an idea how much solar panel i need to buy right so this remember how did we calculate this you can do it for your own right so next question is uh, next we have to decide right uh, one is how much how many solar panel i need and what kind of uh, converters i need okay so the term stand alone system or we will refer it as off grid system so you see there is no electricity grid connected everything is stand alone so i need solar definitely now solar is not available during night time so who will cater my load i need a battery right as simple as that but in between i need a power electronic interface which will charge the battery when solar power is available in excess and it will discharge the battery it will maintain the load voltage etc okay so let us restrict our study to ac load i want to cater 230 volt ac load for indian condition and you know typical uh, rural household will require around 250 2000 watt kind of requirement if you consider power factor etc maybe around say 500 bf of course it can vary but uh, let us uh, conclude that i need a system like this i need to have 230 volt and i need 500 bf so what else i need and what else we need to decide so load i know because load is the uh, most important thing i have to cater load so from with respect to load i have to decide what else i need in the system so then i have to decide what is my solar photovoltaic voltage and power rating i need to decide how much power or voltage i need for battery i need to decide what is the battery voltage level what should be its capacity okay 
Uh, for, for load power rating, we already uh, assumed we can calculate. Then we need to decide which kind of power electronic converter I need and how I'm going to control them. Okay. Remember, our target is to develop something from as scratch as possible. We don't want to buy things and we want to develop. So we will decide later on, you'll see how to select power converter, etc. In, in a broad sense. So now, this also we need to understand. If I want to design such system, what are the different modes of operation of this scheme? So sometimes what you will see that solar power is available, okay? And let's say it is available 500 watt, just as an example. And load demand at that point, let's say it was 100 watt. So what I'll do with the extra watt, I'll charge my battery, okay? Now there is two condition. If battery is kind of uncharged, it can take that power. But if battery is fully charged or its current limit is getting violated, then you cannot extract 500 watt from the solar, right? And the, because you are having extra power, you, are, you have no air to dump it. So based on this condition, we need to define some mode of operation. So first mode you see when PMPP, what is PMPP? It is the maximum power available from solar. If PMPP is greater than load demand, so I, that means I have extra power and I can charge the battery, no problem. Battery is not fully charged. So we'll operate in MPPT mode. Another case, PV power is less than load demand. So I have battery has to supply this additional load demand. And let's say battery has enough charge, no problem. So we'll operate in MPPT. And when I am operating in MPPT, I'll be using MPPT algorithm to operate uh, my solar at this particular point. And I'm happy, no problem. But let's say I'm operating in MPPT mode. And a situation has arisen that power, PV power is more than load demand and battery is already charged. It cannot consume that extra power. So what should I do? If I dump that extra power to battery, battery will overcharge and battery will get damaged. It is risky for life also, right? So what we'll do, we'll deliberately operate at some other point, not at the MPV point, maybe somewhere here. So here actual PV power will be less than PMPV. What I could have generated, I'm generating less than that. And this has to be equal to my load demand plus what maximum my battery can consume. Sometimes if battery is fully charged, then this has to go to zero. You know, battery generally charged using CC, CB mode, right? So for CC, there will be current limit. So based on that, your battery also can consume a maximum power. You should not charge battery with very high current, right? So I have to deliberately reduce my PV power. So that mode I'm referring as non-MPPT mode. Then there will, there will a situation will come that PV power is not, not there at all, right? During night time. So I'm calling it battery only mode. That means PV is not there, battery is supplying entire demand. Now when battery is discharging, there is a situation will come when battery is almost fully discharged. It cannot, it don't have any charge left. So I have to shut down my system, right? These are very simple description of different modes. So you have to keep them in mind. And I have to decide based on some system parameter, how to shift between these modes. So how do you control your system so that it offers seamless transition between all these modes? That itself is a good research topic. Okay, next challenge is that since you are designing such system for a household appliances, our tendency should be to use as low voltage as possible for PV and battery, because this is what uh, sometimes battery I need to replace. Sometimes I need to put water for some sort of battery. Sometimes solar module I would like to clean, right? So some human being may touch them. Maybe our children will go near solar panel and they will touch it for something, right? So that, that can be risky. So in general, for low power system, we would like to use low voltage battery for solar and uh, this kind of uh, battery, right? So, but my load demand is 230 volt DC. So in between, I have to do something such that this voltage can be boosted up, okay? See just around, let's say, if you take an example of 36 volt. So 36 volt to 230 volt, you have to boost up inside your power electronic converter. So one reason for low voltage, as I said, is safety concern. Another reason why I'm interested in low voltage for low power system is if I use a high voltage system for solar, I have to connect so many modules in series. 
right? Typically in market, the maximum voltage uh, with which these modules are available is around 36 volt MPP. So uh, later on, I'll show you that if I use a inverter, because finally you need a DC to AC converter to cater AC load because solar and DC, they're, they're DC, right? Solar and battery. So for an inverter, if you want to have 230 volt output, the DC bus voltage requirement is around 380 to 400. So just see how many modules you need to connect in series, right? It is more than 10. Now, if you connect 10 modules in series and one of them are shaded, what will happen? It will impact entire power output, right? Your power output will drastically reduce. So that is the reason that this kind of uh, series uh, connection is avoided as much as possible when your power requirement is low. When you have a high power requirement, then current becomes an issue. So you want higher voltage system so that current can come down. So our target will be mostly to connect these uh, modules in parallel. And you might you must be knowing that uh, modules connected in parallel are, are more, uh, sorry, less prone to shading problem. Okay. So they give much better result when this kind of shading occurs. So if shading occurs in one panel, it is not going to affect other panel much. Similarly, battery also. If you want to have a high voltage bus using battery, you have to connect so many batteries in series, right? Again, there will be charge equalization problems. So uh, you would like to use low voltage for them. You would like to connect more of them in parallel so that uh, this problems can be addressed. But then you need high voltage boosting. You have to provide uh, quite high gain. So that is one of the requirement. Major, so I have noted down this as a major challenge if you want to design such system. One of them, you need high voltage boosting as I discussed. Second is, I want to ensure as much as possible this MPPT operation. I want to operate my PV at maximum power point. Then I need to protect my battery from over discharge and charge, right? I should not overcharge it. I should not over discharge it then I need to control my load voltage at 230 because that is what load demands. So all this thing we want to achieve. And of course, we want to make the system lower, low cost, higher efficient, and those general requirements. Now, how do I get all this? So typically, most of the solution will be like this. So you have a solar module. You do MPPT using a DC-DC converter. For battery control, you do need a bidirectional converter. and uh, for DC to AC conversion, you need one more converter, right? So this is how typically a system will look like. If you don't want a dedicated converter for battery, you can put battery in the common DC bus. But it will increase stresses on the battery, right? It is directly connected to the middle path. So sometimes it is not recommended. But if you want to go for a local system, uh, people use this also. Now, what my load demands, it is 230 volt, okay? And you know, DC to AC converter, most of the common configurations are age bridge inverter. And of course, mostly we'll be using voltage source inverter, which looks like this, okay? And you know, we'll be applying sinusoidal pulse width modulation. And if you employ this kind of sinusoidal pulse width modulation, you, you'll see that the voltage requirement this DC bus voltage requirement minimum as, as per theory, I can uh, show you the derivation, etc. if you are interested in an easier manner, but that is not the topic now. So what this expression is saying is that V0 fundamental, okay? So, you know, at the inverter output, I'll have fundamental component plus harmonics, right? So generally what we do, we put a filter, LC filter, and then we connect the load. So if you design your filter properly, then uh, the load will be most, mostly fundamental component, right? So this fundamental component, its, R, uh, its expression is MA into Vs sin omega t. So fundamental component is definitely its peak. Output fundamental peak is MA into Vs. Vs is nothing but your source voltage. MA, you know, modulation index, it can go from zero to one. So maximum value, I can use one, right? So what does it imply? Peak value of the fundamental. What is our requirement? It is 230 RMS. So peak will be 230 into root two. That means 325. So I need at least 
Vs is 325 volt. This is theoretical minimum requirement. But you know, when we derive this equation, we neglect so many things like switch voltage drop we neglect, uh, filter drop we neglect, etc. So we need to consider some margin if you want to design it for a practical purpose. And you will see that we need around 380 to 400 minimum DC bus voltage to get 230 at the output. Okay. So 230 is my requirement. Here I need around 380 to 400, uh, 360 also sometimes accept, uh, acceptable if you design your filter voltage drop very low. Now, if you want to keep your solar and battery voltage low, now there is a question how much low I want. So typically if your power rating is around 250 to 500 watt kind of system, a 12 volt battery is uh, kind of acceptable. You see several inverter in your home, Microtech, Sucam, Luminous, etc. If these are hardly around 500 VA to 600 VA, they will use a 12 volt battery. Then 500 to maybe around 1 kVA, they may use 24. Maybe 1 kVA to 5 kVA, they will use 48 volt, etc. So this is kind of uh, product level information that what battery voltage roughly you can go depending on power. Now. Let us say to just uh, make discussion easier, we are going with 36 volt here, 36 volt here. So I need a gain of around 10. Voltage gain requirement is 10, okay? So some of the student, they, if I ask this question that what kind of DC-DC converter you are going to use here? They will say we'll use a boost converter because we know boost converter didn't give me any gain, right? But once we start developing boost converter in hardware, you will understand, or they will understand rather, that practically achievable gain from boost converter would be hardly 2.5 to 3. It doesn't mean that it cannot go beyond that, but beyond that, your efficiency will come down drastically. So practically, when you design boost converter, the gain will be limited to around 2.5 to 3, not more than that. So I cannot use a standard boost converter here. Same thing with the battery converter. When your gain requirement is high, what you do? You use an isolated DC-DC converter. Like flyback, forward, full bridge, etc. Then you can get decent gain with high voltage gain. And sometimes you can use coupled inductor based high gain DC-DC converter. But remember, you have to make it bidirectional. So if you go with this kind of solution, you need so many transformer and then uh, different now uh, higher number of switches because you need to make it bi-directional it, it makes your life difficult another solution is i will use a low frequency transformer at the output of dc to ac converter so i can reduce this voltage maybe i'll use 72 volt so 36 to 72 gain is 2 i'm happy with it no problem then using 72 volt uh, maybe i'll get around 30 volt or 35 volt rms at the output i use a step up transformer but as you know, low frequency transformer will have a problem of higher size, wide volume, etc. Right. So if you don't want, you need to get a better solution. So I'll skip this part or let it discuss. So this kind of solution I was referring. Basically, you have a standard boost converter, standard bidirectional converter, basically class C kind of chopper, and you use 72 volt and use a high frequency, uh, sorry, low frequency step up transformer. That's how uh, you can still uh, design this system. And another important point, all of us uh, when we'll be de developing hardware, this capacitor, basically any filter here is very, very important. So sometime I um, uh, experience this question. So I'll just quickly cover up this one. Why we need that capacitor? See, if you use a kind of a buck converter or some converter with a switch like this, where this current is, how it look like when switch is on, maybe you'll have some current. When switch is off, you'll have zero current. Then again, this kind of current, pulsating current. Right. So then sometime you are operating maybe somewhere here, 
based on just look at the current curve and sometime current will go to zero that means you are operating here so you are fluctuating between some operating point and this voc you are not continuously operating at maximum power point right so you will be losing some power ideally what i want that my solar should be operated at this particular voltage and this particular current i want my current to look like flat value okay at this value imp i don't want any pulsating current so to achieve that we must use filter so as you can see boost converter inherently has an inductive filter okay but you know if this inductor current will look something like this so what is uh, it's implying basically you will be shifting your operating point between maybe here and here let's say your impp is 10 ampere and your boost converter that current is like this so sometime it will go 11 sometime it will go 9 uh, like that right so it will shift between these two it will keep on oscillating so you are not continuously getting the exact maximum power point so another approach is of course you use a capacitor which can uh, take out that ac ripple and this current can be that 10 ampere so this this filters design and uh, their uh, operation is very very important if you want to extract maximum power from the solar photovoltaic panel it is 310 yeah i have another 15 minutes so i'll quickly go through right so last slide we discussed how much power i need for my home and then we also understood how much energy we need now let us quickly get an understanding how we will decide solar uh, module requirement okay now you know solar modules are not uh, available at infinite ranges right they will have some uh, availability so let us say in a local market, you know you have a solar module available of this rating. Just for example, right? You may have something like 200 watt, 300 watt, etc. But let's say in your budget, in your availability constraint, this module is there. And I want to see how, how many of such module I need. That is the objective. So what I'll do, I know my energy requirement. Okay. But see, this is solar module is rated for power not for energy so power and you know this is peak power what does it mean at that one kilowatt per meter square insulation it will be giving you 110 watt that is roughly the meaning maximum it will give you 110 watt at that standard test condition but i have to get uh, energy information so what i'll do i understand the solar very radiation will vary maybe something like this it is maybe uh, at peak, it might be one kilowatt per meter square. Sometime it will be 200 watt per meter square, right? And sometime it will be 300. It will, it will keep on varying, right? So if I could know a kind of average value that this total duration is, let's say eight hours. Now, if I take an average, maybe I'll be able to say that one kilowatt power one kilowatt per meter square that kind of insulation is available for let's say three hours or four hours okay so what i'm doing instead of calculating for entire uh, time duration when solar is available i'm concentrating in some hour where i can will be able to roughly say that during that hour effectively per day i'm getting one kilowatt per meter square now from where i'm going to get this kind of number i'll refer to solar map in india so this figures you see 4.4, 4.8, 5.2. This is signifying this number. Effectively, on an average basis, how many hours you are getting one kilowatt per meter square kind of irradiation. So for example, let's say I'm sitting near Kolkata, I look at this point, and I know it is maybe around 4.5 or something, right? If you are at some other place, you, you know roughly. So this is the one kilowatt power uh, irradiance available to me and maybe for that time right so i'll put that time information here i already had energy information i am having the time information now so this will give me the peak power requirement right energy by time will give me peak power requirement and from uh, if i know how many uh, what is the rating per module then i'll divide that peak power requirement by number of uh, the rating of that solar module 
and that's how I'm going to get how many module I need. Of course, uh, 3.76 I'm not going to use, I'm going to use next integer number, four modules, right? So what we did, we first calculated energy requirement for my home, then uh, uh, per day, uh, how many, for how many hour I'm having peak irradiance kind of situation that roughly I'm getting. And from that I'm calculating the power requirement and I know for each module, it can give 110. So I'm dividing it by number of module. And finally, I'll be able to decide roughly what is my module requirement. Then I can connect those modules in series or parallel as per my requirement. So this is how roughly you will be able to calculate how much solar power we need. Then next comes, uh, then how will you decide your inverter sizing, right? So inverter, I know my AC load requirement is this much watt, this power. So total power requirement from, from my inverter, I know, right? That is my absolute requirement. I'll keep some margin, right? Maybe 1.5 times to two times. And that's how I'll decide my power rating of the inverter. Similarly, how do I, I'm going to get battery sizing? A simple approach is per day. Oh, <laughs> per day, how much energy we need, we know already. And there, there is a concept called autonomy. Uh, let's say solar power is not available. So how many days you want your stored energy in the battery to supply your household load, right? So let's say I want it for three days. So this is my energy requirement per day. I multiply three, that is my total energy requirement. And uh, let's say I'm using 12 volt battery. So I divide it by, so energy, energy is nothing but in terms of kilowatt hour, right? So kilowatt is uh, voltage into ampere into hour. Then I'll divide by voltage, 12, right? So that's why, that's why I'm going to get what is my ampere hour requirement. So this 12 is coming because battery voltage. Now you see there are two other factors. One is this 0.85. What is this 0.85? Whatever energy you are storing in battery, you are not going to utilize it fully to the load, right? Because between battery and your load, you are going to have power electronic converter. They are not 100% efficient. So you take some extra power in the battery, right? Because some power is going to be lost in your power converters. So you take a measure for that. Another figure is 0.6. What is this implying? Whatever battery capacity you are, you are having, you won't be able to discharge it fully, right? There is a concept called depth of discharge. For example, lead acid battery, if it is uh, 100 ampere hour, you won't be able to discharge it till 100 and ampere uh, entirely. So maybe you will be able to discharge it up to 50 to 60 percent. The rest of the capacity is actually not usable. For lithium ion battery, you can go maybe around 70, 80 percent. The rest of the uh, capacity, though it is there, but you won't be able to utilize it. Uh, it will it may damage your battery. You don't want to deep discharge your battery. So there will be always a limit. So well, let us hit battery. So what does it imply? You have to oversize your battery. Whatever is your bare minimum requirement, you have to oversize your battery, right? So this factor is considering lead acid battery. So finally, you know how much uh, ampere hour capacity you need for your home. And then you will decide solar controller rating. So solar voltage you already know because you have decided the module rating, you know what is your power rating, right? And then you keep some safety margin and you're going to get power rating. So this is how on a very rudimentary level, how you select your main components, okay? Then as I said, a basic converter configuration looks something like this. Maybe this one we can use to get uh, this sort of system done. But what is the problem of this approach? One of the problem is that you see your, you need a low frequency transformer. What is the drawback? Size of the system will be bulkier, heavy, right? It will need more space. Another problem is, uh, I think someone else again turn on the mic. So if it is not in intentional, please mute it. And if you have any question, uh, please uh, feel free to ask. So one problem is this low frequency transformer. Another problem uh, is not the problem, but you look at this, you are using a dedicated converter for solar photovoltaic. 
and during night time what is this converter doing it is doing nothing because there is no solar power so what this converter is uh, good for nothing during that time and you know solar power is not available for more than half of a day so that means this converter will sit idle doing nothing during most of the time right so why you want to use it can we design a system without using it right that is one of the objective that we'll see how we can do second is you see from pv to battery you have two converter coming in cascade so it will affect the system uh, battery charging efficiency can i design my system such that i eliminate this dedicated converter requirement and so what will be my benefit i'll be able to design my system using lesser component i'm expecting efficiency will go up right those things and this is how you are going to control the system i am not going to discuss in detail otherwise <laughs> i think i won't be able to finish on time so as i said i'll be sharing you the slides uh, this is uh, quite elaborately written so that if you just go through the slide most of the things will understand in case you don't understand uh, i'll be happy to answer through email or something right so here what i tried to show you all this different mode i talked about how you can seamlessly transfer from one mode to another using one of the strategies that we use in our hardware or in our simulation etc we don't use uh, any solar irradiance measurement or load power measurement nothing we just most of the time we just see this this particular voltage and looking at this voltage i'll get lot of indication right whether my battery is uh, whether uh, the system need to move from non mppt to mppt and uh, so this kind of tricky situation lot of thing actually i understand from this voltage just looking at this voltage so how why it happens and how do you do uh, all these things are discussed right so if you have some time please go through them and if time permits later on uh, we will discuss this is a very nice concept which is uh, pretty good for in, in fact some uh, controller in uh, microgrid also okay okay but anyway that is not our focus today let me skip this Right, so coming back to the uh, system that we are going to discuss mostly uh, for DSP implementation also. So remember, this was our traditional solution. If you don't want to use any low frequency transformer, one solution could be that you used one high gain DC DC converter in between. So basically, here you put a high gain DC DC converter, and then you use regular inverter. right the but then you see you need need you need four converter okay so you know you need more number of switches etc so in one of our what we do it basically we designed instead of using a regular age bridge inverter we designed a integrated converter so what we did basically we took age bridge inverter and a bug boost dc dc converter and we merged them together so it is like we act as a kind of a boost inverter to me having input at this particular point like my regular input and finally output will be this part so it it see this part it is basically a age bridge inverter and if you look at this part it is nothing but a modified bug boost converter so some switches are being shared by bug boost converter as well as inverter and as a result what i am getting i am able to use the inverter section as a kind of high gain or higher gain in inverter so it, it doesn't need 400 or 380 volt at the dc bus if i give lower dc bus maybe around 70 80 it is still able to conduct so based on that we also did uh, this hardware and everything we implemented all this code all the control chess the guy said using a texas instrument digital uh, signal controller it is there you can see and these are the lead acid batteries for laboratory purpose to use solar emulator and this was the converter but then this problem as i said main problem is this dc dc converter its utilization is very poor and also it affects system efficiency so next what we wanted to do as some of you already asked in the beginning whether can i use some multi port kind of uh, converter to solve this purpose so then we made an attempt 
and we designed a converter. We use a traditional DC to AC converter, but here we used a, a new converter. We this was our proposal: a single stage DC to AC converter, which can do multiple things. What it can do? It can do maximum power point tracking. It can protect the battery from overcharge, discharge. It can provide very high voltage gain, right? So everything we could do just using only two switching devices, two MOSFET rather, and two diode. So we did not use a, uh, a converter with which needs so many switches. Here you can see if you go with traditional system, if you're using a boost converter, you need at least one switch. Bidirectional converter, you need at least two switch, but they won't be able to give you high gain, right? And then you need one diode also here. So with using even less switching device, so, uh, MOSFET, we could we uh, could get all those things. So how did we design it? Let me take a step-by-step -step procedure. And maybe if you follow this, you can come up with your own inverter or own converter also. So the starting point was that my voltage gain was a problem. So I, con I started connecting PV and battery in series. Very simple. Next problem was how do I charge battery from solar? So I know if I want to charge battery, I have to send current in this direction. So I connected an inductor. Now this inductor should store energy from the solar. So what I should do, I connect a switch in this fashion. So when I turn on switch, current will flow like this, right? Then when I turn off the switch, current will flow like this. Simply I'm charging my battery, no problem. So this is it. This you'll see is basically a modified kind of bug boost structure. So this is one part done. Next, when solar is not there, I should able to discharge the battery, right? So I cannot just put a diode here because to discharge the battery, I need a current flow in the reverse direction. So I put a switch here. So when I turn on the switch, current will flow like this. When I turn off the switch, current can flow like this. So for example, if I connect it, sorry, load here. Then I'll be able to discharge my battery, right? So finally, integrate both the converter together. This was for battery discharge. This was for battery charge, right? I need both of them together. So we'll combine them together. So these two switching devices are nothing but your uh, controllable switches. And uh, you can do battery charging as well as discharging. Okay. Now this problem is solved. Now, where, where should I connect my load? I need, I need, finally, my aim should be to target load, right? So one of the solution could be, uh, I used another DC-DC converter here. Maybe I can use a DC-DC converter and then I can use some DC load. Or uh, I can use an inverter and a low frequency transformer, right? To cater my uh, AC load. So this thing can be done. So what approach we took, is interestingly you see in this particular if you want to plot voltage here between these two terminal when this switch is turned on you are getting a zero voltage and when this switch is off this switch is on these two switches will be complementary in nature so when the top switch is on you are getting total v battery plus vpv here so this kind of waveform you will get at this point now you can understand uh, if you remember buck converter, you will remember the voltage. At this point, how it looks like, it looks exactly like this, right? Because when switch is on, you are getting VDC. When switch is off, you are getting the diode was conducting. So you get zero voltage. So it looks like a buck converter. So next, if I already have this voltage, I can integrate the filter here. Right, so what now next is with this structure, I'm just putting a output filter section of the buck converter. So what it is giving me a buck boost kind of structure and I'm infusing a buck converter with it, right? So it become kind of a new hybrid converter. So I can have my load here. So this is one step. I can use some DC load or I can uh, use a inverter and I can feed it to uh, AC load. So this, this see this has become a three port converter or TPC. But using this, I'm still not able to get high voltage, right? 
so high voltage gain is required because i need to apply 230 volt i'm how i'm going to do that the next observation you can make if i plot voltage across this inductor how it looks like it it, it looks like this one right when this top device is on you are getting positive voltage on the bottom device is on you are getting negative voltage so then an idea will click on your mind that if across inductor i am getting this kind of voltage why can't i replace the inductor by a transformer it is a high frequency signal i can use a high frequency transformer and i can get voltage boosting no problem so next step is what replace this inductor by a transformer so across the primary i'll get sometime positive voltage i'll get sometime negative voltage and if i use a uh, amplification kind of transformer step up transformer at the secondary i'll get higher voltage now i can rectify it i get a dc voltage and depending on my trans ratio i'll be able to get any voltage at the output theoretically right so my voltage gain problem is solved battery charging discharging problem is solved my uh, mppt problem is solved because you see for a given battery voltage i can always control this duty ratio to maintain a voltage here right so i can use maximum power point tracking and finally what i'll do i'll put a inverter at the output so i'll select my trans ratio such a way that i get around 380 400 something like that or in some controllable range and then i'll use the inverter it will give me 230 volt very simple so i am not using any dedicated converters of solar solar photovoltaic i am not using any low frequency transformer and you see how many switches here we are using only six control switches and two diode and all this objective i can do i can use in fact 12 volt battery also right no problem i can use 36 volt pv i can use uh, 24 volt so all this thing we can do using this kind of solution then what we understood this this scheme was developed and then hardware is also are taken and we could publish paper also so then what we understood uh, for battery and solar we still need some additional filter element because inherently you see uh, the battery port was not having any dedicated filter solar is not having any dedicated filter i have to add additional converter so in the next scheme what we uh, approached that we modified the structure slightly instead of putting a single inductor we distributed them and uh, for the both pv and battery port we uh, made them inductively interfaced port so that uh, those uh, ripple current problem can be solved right so what i am trying to tell you is that just looking at the circuit and understanding the circuit operation and your requirement you want your solar photovoltaic and battery current to be as ripple free as possible you want to use low voltage system so you should get high voltage gain so just looking at the circuit carefully and understanding your requirement you will be able to come up with your own converter right for example here i am already getting high frequency ac right so now then i am converting it to dc then again i am converting dc to ac so maybe some of you can design an interesting circuit which can give you directly this high frequency ac to low frequency ac that is also doable right some solution might be already there so you can come up with your own system own new converter you can do some modification here you can come up with your own converter so this is very much doable and this area is is a very interesting area so as i said uh, we did harder development and again how use the tsp kit you can see here and uh, we wrote the code etc which roughly some some uh, glimpse i'll show you next it is uh, 3:30 yeah i'll just stop in 2 3 minutes and these are some of the hardware results that we took from our experimental setup you see we maintained 230 volt ac battery and pv we took 36 volt we gave lot of different operating conditions suddenly we disconnected solar then uh, we have extra power from solar so that battery is fully charged so all this overcharge protection a lot of things we did and this converter was showing very good efficiency the entire scheme including inverter my peak efficiency we are getting around 94 which was at that point uh, that efficiency was pretty good and in fact it was uh, well appreciated then also we did some other work uh, let me not go into all of the all of them right so with this uh, i conclude my first part where i wanted to give you an idea of what are the system requirement 
for off grid system and how you can design your own system from scratch right in the next part i am going to uh, focus on this dsp implementation part i'll show you how simply you can write all these logics so maybe we'll take a uh, two three minutes break here i'm not sure uh, whether you need it uh, a minimum are you there yes yes yeah can you take two three minutes break yes yes you can nice. okay okay of course i'll be available if you have any question you can ask me else uh, we'll just take two three minutes break but i'm here if you have any question please feel free to ask uh, sir i have few questions yes uh, with regard to the uh, hardware actually okay uh, sir actually yes. i am also doing uh, the same uh, with this dc microgrid implementation mm -hmm. and uh, like uh, i just started working with the current and voltage sensor tuning so okay. uh, basically sir whenever i am trying to uh, tune this uh, current or voltage uh, voltage sensor along with that uh, this uh, piccolo board mm -hmm. i am doing with the piccolo board so uh, i got some uh, some tuning issues sir like uh, the output of the uh, uh, this particular sensor this uh, lamp sensor is is very fluctuating sir so how we can reduce that sir yeah i don't know i have to look at your hardware see we also use this uh, this blue thing you can see right we use this current sensor and for voltage sensor yes, we sir. did not buy anything from the market what we did we designed our own voltage sensor with op amp op amp and voltage dividers and okay. but uh, we did not get too much fluctuation as you are saying i don't know why you are getting i have to look at your hardware design and all but what typically happens is what we experience is that they do very little bit uh, of course they will be having some switching component and uh, they might be varying little bit so we put a very small capacitor at the final uh, input to dsp to filter out those uh, high frequency component or noises and apart from that what we used to do we used to for we used to first calibrate these sensors for example if i want to measure solar solar photovoltaic voltage so i used to design the sensor and i used to read it in my dsp and i used to make a excel file that uh, i gave this voltage 36 i'm getting in dsp finally after all this conversion etc maybe i'm getting 35 then i'm giving 20 volt i'm getting maybe 19 volt 10 volt so in that entire range we used to uh, do give different voltages let's say from a dc power supply and i used to read the same value in my dsp and i used to plot a excel file mm -hmm. and then we used to do curve fitting so even though you design your system perfectly there will be some offset here and there so if you just do a curve fitting around that you will get a nice equation and roughly you will you'll be able to get the more or less uh, acceptable values that's what okay. we used so to solve instead of problem. using sorry uh, okay so instead of taking the linear value between uh, input and output of uh, this uh, current sensor we can have this curve fitting right sir yes yes uh, sometime I, this this uh, offset was not very linear so 36 volt i am giving 35 but 10 volt i am getting 9 their offset is not exactly same right percent wise sometime i may get 9.5 so we used to uh, do a curve fitting and, and a nice equation we used to get and we used to fit that and more or less it was working fine uh, so my second question is that sir like uh, i am i am doing this hardware along with the matlab so what is your suggestion uh, to use matlab or uh, like uh, plex we can use for getting a better and a quick result no no for uh, this uh, plex you are using for only for simulation or you are for dumping the code into the dsp sir actually i i have not started uh, using the plaques but my question is that like uh, which one is getting easy sir because i am getting stuck uh, at some point using this matlab if you have a very good Along system this yeah, mm -hmm. ram of around 16 gb 20 gb and maybe at least i5 processor etc uh, matlab is matlab is actually very easy to deal with but uh, mm -hmm. As soon as your system becomes complex, for example, the one I was showing, I have too many modes, I have to shift between modes, I have to model the battery, solar modules, etc. So sometimes MATLAB is quite slow, especially if you're running from your laptop with a decent configuration, then MATLAB will take a lot of time. So then you can shift to Plex. 
another advantage of plex you will see uh, of course plex is much lighter software your installation will be very easy and uh, it will run much much faster actually plex inherently uh, use very idealistic switch symbol for doing basic simulation and you will see plex runs much faster than matlab and if you want to model the switch properly plex also gives you that facility sometimes you can uh, actually model the plex switches as per your a proper data sheet so they have some inbuilt library you can you can get all the model for example let's say you want to do switching loss analysis then matlab switch <laughs> models are not that elaborate okay so there you would like to use plex you actually will be able to model the switch in a very very close to a physical switch you are using minute details so use plex and you can ask for any any for the remark sir i think ಯೋಚನೆ ಮಾಡಿ ನೋಡೋಣ ಪ್ಲೀಸ್ ಅನ್ಮ್ಯೂಟ್ ಯುವರ್ ಸೆಲ್ಫ್ ಬೈ ಮಿಸ್ಟೇಕ್ ಐ ಮ್ಯೂಟೆಡ್ ಆಲ್ ಓಕೆ ಯೆಸ್ ಸರ್ did not realize that i was muted uh, am i audible now yes sir you are audible sir yes yeah. yes yeah. so just i'll summarize if your main requirement is studying the control behavior of the power electronic converter this pi controller tuning then uh, this shifting between different modes and all then matlab is a good choice but if you want to look more from a power electronic hardware perspective then plex is better you can do loss analysis thermal modeling a lot of thing you can add then plex runs much faster yeah okay so we we can say that sir for a beginner uh, like plex is good with respect to hardware interface yeah but see uh, using plex i am not sure whether you can dump the code into the dsp but uh, no, sir, rec- recently more- they have uh, shri sir recently they have uh, uh, give the package for this uh, tms uh, board sir okay then we we have not done it but i think then then it is a good i mean you can go ahead with that okay actually sir i have i'm stuck with the basic uh, like uh, basic things uh, like uh, this sensor tuning and all i just stuck and uh, it's it, it some point of time uh, i get stuck with the matlab also <laughs> yeah maybe i don't know that that's why you are uh, if you have a good research group it helps a lot of problem get solved Uh, yes, another thing is alone, if, that is why yeah, yeah that's what we learned during our phd's i think minimum will also agree we had a very good group there we used to solve each other problem and it was really good experience there yes yeah <laughs> more more than from your supervisor you would learn more, much more from your friends mm-hmm. that you. environment yes, is missing I, in most of the colleges i agree sir so what i suggest is that Uh, what you can do you can take a one or two month internship with some uh, senior faculties maybe at other iits or uh, in a uh, in a place where hardware development is given more uh, importance right so you can request them for a one or two month internship you can go there you can uh, discuss with that student group and i think that will be really helpful if you can do that okay so fine sir yeah well otherwise if you write an email to a faculty using it there for this kind of a problem most probably they won't reply but if you can go there physically and stay there for 2 3 months i think uh, that uh, that will be quite useful for you okay yes sir yes sir yeah. thank you sir. in case in case any of you need this kind of help you can always write to us uh, we'll see whether we can host you for one or two months and we'll, we can discuss okay yes yeah okay any other uh, question from the participants what is the time yeah then uh, minimum shall i go to the dsp part yes 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 okay and yeah actually uh, professor mini uh, she told me that uh, if we could do some harder demonstration it would have been better unfortunately for this particular system uh, i am not 
having the facility but i will just like to show you another product again again on the similar line for electric vehicle let me know uh, if the audio is coming is the audio coming or to do some not yet no sir no there is generally there is an option called i can use my uh, system audio but i am not getting it here anyway i'll just briefly describe what this product is all about yeah so uh, let me mute this it will help me to discuss yeah i'm i am expect that you can see the video uh, please confirm whether you can see the video running yes, yes sir yes sir yes okay yeah so this is one of the one of our project a hardware development project where we targeted a product development generally most of our work is uh, based on laboratory prototype we don't apply in real field so this was a unique uh, for that perspective we wanted to design a bldc motor and motor controller along with some additional feature in the motor controller for electric three wheeler what are those additional feature uh, some of them are like range prediction for Three wheeler, then uh, regenerative braking, clubbed with mechanical braking, a concept called brake blending, then uh, some fault code generation, and then uh, what we did is basically all this additional feature. If I list, it will be even longer. These features comes under a, another controller known as vehicle supervisory controller, which are there. Uh, available in high end electric vehicles they have a motor controller separate they have a vehicle controller separately but for low cost solution like electric two wheeler or three wheeler you don't have luxury to have two different unit so we try to combine them together in a single unit so that it does much better than a motor controller it will do all the motor controller thing but on top of that it will uh, rise uh, generate uh, fault alarm etc if something is getting heated up it will restrict the motor operation a lot of thing it will do but instead of putting it as a two separate controller what we did we decided a uh, microcontroller which is having dual core processor so in one core the master core we did vehicle supervisory control and on the slave core we implemented this motor controller unit and in a single microprocessor all these logics were written And, and the same product basically now we are having this motor controller and vehicle control unit for electric three wheeler so this uh, right now the demonstration you are seeing is basically where it was at the initial stage we just mounted all the switches all the component in a pcb and then uh, we wanted to see whether the vehicle is running or not so the motor you see at the lower end that was actually one of the motor designed by us and then uh, a updated version is also now there it is like a older video so this motor was designed by our team and motor controller was also designed by our team and you will see this vehicle is now running it is able to uh, have some gradient also it can easily climb up and overall what we see overall package efficiency was 3 to 4% improved than the existing product that was also one of the encouraging part then in the next part this uh prototype version was eliminated and we made a package maybe i'll just show you the package it is still under improvement so this kind of you can see uh, we what another interesting approach we took was a two pcb approach basically in the uh, power board we had this mosfet etc and on top of it we had a smaller logic board so our idea was that for most of the application your logic board is going to remain same your microcontroller for example let's say i want to use it for a 3 kilowatt system or a 250 watt system then my more or less logic board is going to remain same i'll just replace my power card and i'll be able to design it for different other power rating so basically it is a scalable kind of solution scalable and modular solution then we uh, did the casing etc and we put it that entire solution in the vehicle see it is mounted there and having three four people on board this was a uh, run on road also 
So there, of course, we used a microcontroller because DSP is slightly on the higher cost and uh, it doesn't very much suitable for rather high end for three wheelers. So we used a low cost microcontroller solution. Now uh, this on-road testing, etc., we could do. Uh, slowly, we are now approaching certifications and. Uh, and two, three industry already showed interest in uh, getting this kind of solution. Now we have to reduce the cost a little bit because <laughs> we as an academician, you know, we are not very good on cost optimization. So we have to work on that. And we are already approaching several uh, organizations for doing this EMI, MC testing, then some other IP, IP testing, environmental testing on those kind of things. And if everything goes well, we are expecting that in next three, four months, maybe we'll be able to see the final product product of course uh, we already filed a patent for it because for electric three wheeler this integrated solution is not yet available so fully the patent also will be granted so uh, this is the demonstration in case uh, you want to know more about it or you would like to contribute to this kind of project please feel free to write to me uh, we need a lot of more manpower men or human power rather, not manpower sorry and if any of you are interested to collaborate or contribute, please feel free to write to me. We need a uh, lot of support. So with this, let me go back and quickly, I'll tell you uh, how we implement this kind of uh, off-grid system in hardware. So finally, when we see this kind of circuit diagram, it looks like that is very easy, right? What is there? A uh, few uh, inductor you buy from market, transformer and switch, etc. you just have and then it will work, right? But those who have done hardware, they will know it is much more beyond that, right? So it is not only few semiconductor switches, capacitor, inductor, you need several other components, right? For example, you need sensing arrangement. Because you want to sense output voltage, solar voltage, uh, battery current, battery voltage, etc. You need driver circuit. You need a uh, digital controller, maybe like DSP or microcontroller. You need PCBs where you'll be mounting all this component. You need heat sink. You need wires. You need track. Then soldering element. You need terminals. And so many other things, right? Uh, you, you can you can uh, make this list even longer. So what I'm trying to tell you is that this circuit, when you want to implement in hardware, in apart from all these circuit elements that you're seeing in the diagram, you need several other things, right? So today our focus will be on this DSP side, how we are going to do it. So most of our solutions are based on this Texas instrument uh, 28335 DSP. It's a very powerful DSP. And uh, since it is a lab prototype, we use a dock station, basically evaluation board. So you see uh, it is a support base and on top of it, you insert a daughter card. Basically, and this is the daughter card you insert on it and it has all the peripherals included. But of course, when you go for actual product, you will be mainly using this uh, main the DSP IC and some of these peripherals. Uh, this solution is going to be much smaller in size. So then you see all these pin are taken out and here number of pins you can see this several pins are there what are their names all this you'll be able to see right so this is a dsp is having a clock frequency of 150 megawatts is very powerful and then it has you typically you will be able to generate 12 pwms but under certain cases you can go beyond that also so regular pwm you can do you can drive 12 number of switches and another issue is that all this DSP or microcontroller that you can use in your system, they are limited to 3.3 to 5 volt. Okay. So this is very important observation. The input they can take. Now, what do you mean by input? I need to send some uh, signal to them, right? For example, I need to send what is my output voltage, what is my solar photovoltaic voltage, solar photovoltaic current. So what I'll do from my actual hardware, where I'm mounting all my switches, connecting solar, battery, etc. So there I'll put a sensing board. That sensor will send information to my DSP. So that will be my input signal. And that signal has to be within 0 to 3.3 volt for this DSP mostly. 
and in general either 0 to 3.3 or 0 to 5 volt so what is signifying you can send only dc signal to the dsp you cannot send negative signal so then uh, student will ask this question my output voltage is ac how how can i send signal to dsp because it is a negative voltage i cannot send any negative signal then this amplitude is 230 rms what does it mean the peak value is 325 but i can send only up to 3.3 right so i cannot directly feed this signal to dsp your dsp will simply burn right so then i need a signal conditioning board which will actually take this signal as input and it will condition that and will make this signal look like a variation from 0 to 3.3 volt right how for ac signal what we'll do basically first we'll step down the signal using a voltage divider circuit or similar solution then we'll give a dc offset so you take the ac signal first minimize it uh, amplitude for example this 325 and minus 325 is my requirement what i'm going to do maybe i'll pass it to the resistor divider i'll make it look like minus 1.5 to 1.5 so let's say principally i'm using a low frequency transformer step down transformer so 325 should give me 1.5 i'll use trans ratio accordingly but of course, in real practice, we never use a transformer. We use op-amp or voltage divider kind of solution. Or some ready-made voltage sensor is also available in the market. If you want to know more about this sensor interface, I think one talk was already organized. If you need more details, I can also uh, help you with that. Then what we do, we add 1.5 volt to it. So as a result, my signal looks something like this. It becomes DC and within 3 volt or 3.3 volt. Right? And inside DSP, I subtract that 1.5. So effectively, it again becomes an AC signal inside my DSP. And for DC signal, what we do? Basically, you have to uh, step down according as per your requirement. right? And that's how you send the signal to your DSP. And DSP output also, it will give you a signal in between 0 to 5 volt or 0 to 3.3 volt. So let's say you want to generate PWM signal. So you will, at some of the pin, you will generate this kind of pulses, on off on off pulses. The maximum amplitude is going to be 3.3 volt and 0 volt. And as you know, for driving a MOSFET, typically you need around 10 to 12 volt to turn it on and maybe a 0 volt to turn it off. For IGBT, you need around 12 to 15 volt to turn it on and maybe around minus 7, minus 10 volt to turn it off, right? For IGBT, remember, we always need a negative drive also to uh, turn it off quickly. For MOSFET, it is not mandatory, but you can also give minus 5, minus 7 volt. No problem. It will turn off faster. So DSP cannot give you this negative volt. It cannot give you voltage like 10, 12 volt. So in between what you do, you use a driver circuit. So DSP will just give you the intelligent information, when to turn on, when to turn off a switch. But those voltage amplitude is not sufficient to actually drive a MOSFET or IGBT. So you use solution like driver circuit, right? And uh, we'll do that. So before uh, applying your DSP, you will study what is this spin diagram. So 28335, this spin diagram will be available to you. So you can understand which pin will be ADC. ADC is, as you know, analog to digital converter. So it will take analog signal and it feed as a digital signal to your DSP. And inside DSP will write your code, etc. And finally, DSP will give you gate pulse. That is the objective. So in which pin you should give gate pulse, everything you will understand from this pin diagram, which is pretty self-explanatory. Then how do we write the code in DSP? I have to implement a closed loop controller. For example, I want to uh, control the output voltage at 230 volt. So what I'll do, I'll set my reference command. I'll compare actual voltage, sensed voltage. Then it will give me an error. Maybe I'll feed it to a PI controller. Then a PI controller will generate suitable DUT ratio or modulation index, right? Modulating signal. And there will be a PWM generator, which will finally translate all this information into gate pulse. That is the basic cracks. 
So how do I write this PI controller or this maximum power point tracking algorithm or those mood shifting algorithm? One approach is uh, you use this daughter card, or sorry, this uh, evaluation board, and a software comes known as Code Composer Studio, CCS. So there you can write, uh, please confirm whether you can see this uh, notepad, some C programming written over here. Yes, yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah thank you. So they are basically in Code Composer Studio, you can write this kind of C program. You need not write in a microprocessor or that, that machine level language. Simply write code in C language. So how do you write C language? You know you have to uh, have some header and then you define all this uh, variable fast, whether it is integer or float. Then uh, you start reading your ADC values. Uh, for example, this part of code, is for writing my MPPT logic. I used, sometime uh, we used part of an observe MPPT algorithm. Sometime we used to use incremental conductance algorithm. Mostly we used to do this kind of two algorithm. So basically what you do, you sense PV voltage, PV current, you, you compare their value. For example, if you're using part of an observe, what you do, uh, the present solar voltage and present solar current, you compare them with their previous, right? And as a result, you are comparing the resultant power. So if your power is higher than the previous power, previous step power, you know you are doing good. So you do, you give some uh, command in the same direction. Let's say you are increasing solar voltage. In the last step, you increase the solar voltage by let's say 0.1 volt and your power is increased. So in the next step, what you are going to do, you increase the voltage further by 0.1 volt. This is how you are going towards the peak point. And if you cross the peak point, what will happen? If you increase the solar voltage by 0.1, now your power will come down. So you don't want to give any perturbation, right? So what you do, you just perturb. That means you give a reference change in voltage or duty ratio. You see whether power has increased or not. If power increased, you give perturbation in the same direction. If power is reduced, you give perturbation in the reverse direction. So all those things you can write using simple C logic, right? See what we are doing. We are seeing P new and we are subtracting P new minus P old. That's how I'm getting the difference between present power and previous power. And I'm checking whether this is more than uh, a significant value. Then I change my voltage in the same direction. Otherwise I change in the reverse direction. So these are nothing but very simple C level programming. Okay. So this is how you implement this uh, MPPT algorithm. Then you sense all this ADC information, right? Uh, you need to sense output voltage, output current, battery voltage. So you read all this information. Then you use some PI controller. Let's say you want to control output voltage at some value. So you, you generate an error, use a PI controller. So this is how using Code Composer Studio. So this is an example of a PI controller. So my MPPT algorithm is telling me you control your PV voltage at 30 volt. So what I'll do, I'll take that 30 volt as reference, like, like this V reference. Then I'll compare this with actual PV voltage. Okay. This is my sensed voltage. This is the reference voltage. Interestingly, you see, uh, for solar photovoltaic system, reference is kept at minus sign. Okay. It is uh, ultra of traditional uh, DC-DC converter or other control where we always keep reference in the plus sign of the comparator, right? But so solar photovoltaic system, actually you are controlling the input quantity, not the output quantity, right? So you will be putting a minus on the reference and plus on the actual signal. Then what is this? It is nothing but your error, right? Then what? once you got error, what you have to do? You have to multiply with a constant term, which is Kp, right? So Kp into error plus Ki into its integrated version, right? So simply you write this code and your job is done, right? So for example, this part is just doing the KP part. So my KP, VPB is my KP. Uh, basically for a PI controller, you need to give a constant KP. So KP into error and this part is giving me the integral action. So this is that integral action. Now integration, how can you implement? You can use any Euler forward Euler integration or Ewens method, you know. Uh, and maybe since second year or first year, you've already learned how you did integration, right? You have to just make a discrete version of that. So you already do PI controller, then PI controller will give you finally that duty ratio expression or modulating signal. Once you get that, what you do, you set your 
PWM registers. So in PWM register, what you will do, you will see whether you want to use a sort of kind of carrier or you want to use a triangle carrier. So based on that, you set your PWM register. Okay. So basically, in register, you will write a word in digital format. So if you set a particular bit one, it will count up. If you set it zero, it will count down. All those things you can set, right? So how do you know how to set? There is a very good manual for DSP. You can write, uh, uh, you can read it. Which register you have to put what value to make it a sorted carrier? How do you select the frequency of the sorted carrier? Everything you can do. Okay. So in easier way, I'll show you. So this is how uh, in Code Composer Studio how you uh, can write code for this kind of uh, complicated system. You you uh, break the system in several parts. For example, DC DC converter, you put one segment. Inverter, you put one segment. One segment, you put your uh, mode change algorithm, right? And you finally will be happy with the output. This is how, how you deal with the code composer studio. But how do you do it using MATLAB? Let's say you don't want to write all this uh, headache. You don't want to take. So in MATLAB, there is this toolbox available, embedded coder support package for Texas instrument. Okay, so Texas instrument DSP, you can see there is several DSPs, right? So we are using this 28335 family. So MATLAB has a support for it. So what we'll do, we'll go to this toolbox. You have to install this toolbox, toolbox of course. And then go to this CH335 family. Inside it, you'll see all these modules. So you get an ADC module, you get a PWM module, Right, all these modules are ready made available to you. So, now next, what you will do first, you start with this ADC input. Ultimately, you need to sense some uh, signal from your system, right? So, I'm sensing output voltage, PV voltage, PV current, battery voltage, battery current, one of the inductor current. So, all these things I'm sensing. Uh, how do I configure this? I'll show you. Then, I get actual voltage, actual current of inverter, I'll feed it to inverter control block. There, I'll do some control. Finally, it will give me modulation, modulating signal, right? And then I'll do a unipolar PWM or bipolar as per my requirement. Then finally, I'll send that signal to an EPWM module. So EPWM module will have that modulating signal. Inside it, it will generate a sawtooth or triangle carrier. So as we know, if you want to implement PWM, what we'll do? For DC-DC converter, mostly we use sawtooth, right? So I'll generate an up counter. And then this is my duty ratio information or control signal. So this control signal uh, for inverter, what it will be? For inverter, I'm going to use triangle carrier, then a modulating signal. So this modulating signal, I'll feed it to this inputs, this W, A, W, B, okay? And internally, I'll configure this carrier. And then it will compare this and based on that, it will generate gate pulse. And my job is done. It is very easy. So we'll see uh, how, what, what is the role of this each block and roughly how you can configure. Maybe I'll just take another 5-10 minutes. So for EPWM module, see it is already given to you. So you'll be giving that modulating signal here. And these are known as software force input. So sometimes let's say there is some um, over voltage has happened. So you don't want to operate your converter. You want to withdraw all the gate pulse. So then you will send a gate a signal to this input. It will withdraw all the PWM. It will it won't give any gate pulse. So your converter may shut down. For example, let's say standalone mode. My battery is fully discharged. I cannot give any power to load. What should I do? I need to shut down the system. So I'll be sending a signal to this software force action thing and. Uh, I'll withdraw all the pulse. Okay, that I can do. Just sending a uh, input like this. So as soon as I know I have to shut down the system, I'll send a signal to this SFA and SFB, and it will turn off all the gate pulse. Now in each of this EPWM module, finally you'll be able to give two gate pulse. So for example, in inverter we know we have to control two devices per leg, right? S1 and S4 maybe. So this I can control by using one EPWM block. And the modulating signal or duty ratio information, I will feed it here, W, A, and W, B. 
and next part is how do i decide the career right so if i want to use a sorted career i use this kind of up counter or down counter if i want to use a triangle shaped career i'll use up down counter now how do i know uh, what frequency i have to use see when you design your uh, power electronic converter you know your switching frequency right you will be designing your component based on that so maybe you'll use 10 kilohertz 20 kilohertz etc and also you know what is the clock frequency of the dsp for example 28335 uh, clock frequency is 150 megahertz so for each of this step it will be 150 megahertz this time right the time is 1 by frequency so this small tiny steps will be this much step so now if you want 10 kilohertz you know how much time period you need right so this time period you divide by time period of clock you need your counter value right so you follow the simple equation you decide how how many how uh, your counter should count up to what value so maybe i am happy with 20000 counts right so 20000 count into each step is this much time 1 by 150 megahertz so that's how i'm going to get my t switching period and if i'm uh, i know how much i need so based on that i'll change this it's very easy nothing complicated so i'll show you an example software force input i already talked about then uh, another thing is dead bend all of you must be knowing uh, for a voltage source inverter between two switching devices of the same leg we have to generate some dead bend right uh, so that one device completely turns off then we turn on the other device so this dead bend you can easily put here right and either you can put dead bend from your dsp or you can put dead bend in your driver circuit also in most of our hardware we implement dead bend in the hardware level uh this i'll skip so yeah so this epwm as i mentioned for example if i take a inverter i'll be using up down counter right then i'll have that modulating signal now i can decide when i want to generate gate pulse either i can write a logic that when my cmpa this is nothing but that modulating signal if it is greater than triangle i can turn on the gate pulse right or you can do reverse you can start giving gate pulse at zero crossing of your counter then you can stop somewhere here so all this logic you can simply set in by using this parameter and these are very easy if you have not clear idea you just go to this help segment you will see that everything is written in detail how to set each of this point right and it will be more or less done is the time for 12 okay i'll just continue for another 3 minute and we we'll, uh, we'll find out yeah and as you said this adc calibration one of you already said so that is also we are using basically see whatever signal you are sensing first you will make it to a signal conditioning board you feed it to adc that's why it is going inside dsp and inside dsp your codes are written right so uh, inside dsp you have to whatever let's say you have given a gain here so here you will be giving one by gain so that finally in the dsp you will be able to reproduce this number for ac signal as i said we will be giving a dc offset in the signal conditioning circuit so that before in uh, inserting them into adc they become dc quantity right but inside dsp you have to subtract that number okay that uh, offset you have to subtract so that in the dsp you can reproduce what is actually there in your hardware so this is how you get all this adc signal and this amplitude logic i already told basically here also you will write simple c logic for implementing amplitude then there comes pi controller so pi controller 1 by s term we use in matlab simulation but that is in a continuous domain right this kind of dsp is uh, will work in discrete domain so for that you have a uh, dedicated discrete time integrator you have to use this one and how to configure everything is very clearly mentioned so you can do it and uh, i'll be ending up soon so yeah for the inverter control what we did is 
uh, we for a single phase inverter we uh, did the control in dq model so basically uh, we had that alpha component we generated a fictitious 90 degree phase shifted component beta right as is shown here this is the actual signal sensed a 90 degree phase shifted signal was generated then we convert it to dq to make them look dc then we use simple pi controller and finally uh, again back to dq to alpha beta where we get modulating signal then we compared with carrier and uh, the job was done just a minute right so again uh, the actual minute details of all these things it will take a lot of time because it itself is a coursework so uh, i just wanted to give you some idea how uh, this can be done again if you want to know more uh, you can always go through the manuals uh, matlab help support these are pretty straightforward okay and so with this let me wind up it is already 4:15 i don't want to stretch further if you have any specific query i'll be happy to address else uh, you can always write to me uh, my email id is let me share yeah please feel free to write to me if you have any further queries which in case you get later on you always feel free to write to me and i'll be happy to address with this uh, let me thank you very much for attending this course if time permits, please get uh, connected to me through LinkedIn or uh, you can also support me through YouTube. I have a channel there. I have now started working towards uh, putting more lecture, experimental demonstrations in this channel and I hope to grow it. So if you have any suggestion what topic would be better suited, please feel free to uh, comment. Yeah. Yeah, I think I took five extra minutes. Thank you uh, again all the participants and organizing team for giving me this opportunity yeah i am open to question now thank you thank you so much it was a wonderful session <laughs> as expected anyway participants if you have any doubts please ask I think it was a very long session. They must be feeling tired. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. You had shown all that video and all. No, no sir. The session was very nice. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Sir, uh, yeah, I have one doubt. Yes, please. Sir, uh, how to select uh, DC link capacitor? Well? So, means rating of capacitor. DC link capacitor. Okay, okay. Uh, we, for example, uh, maybe I can show you. Just give me a minute. Huh? Now, this DC link capacitor may have uh, several uh, use. Let me just take out an example. So, this is I'm just pulling out a slide from my uh, UG level course where I discuss how to select those filter elements. Okay. Let me share. For Hello. example, if it is a yeah standalone inverter. How do you decide that L value, C value, etc.? Uh, so this is all about that. So basically, here what I'm trying trying to show. Maybe I'll share you these slides. Uh, anyway, it won't be uh, possible for me to discuss entire thing. I'll just give you an idea. So how do you select? For example, let's say you want to design a solar photovoltaic system. Uh, you want 230 volt at the output. So how do you decide this L value, this C value? Then if it is solar photovoltaic system, you need to select this capacitor also, right? That is your question. So how do you select this? Everything, yes, everything I have uh, uh, explained here. Maybe I'll share you the slide. So I, it, this is very straightforward. So this is how you select this inductor. Okay, for which sw uh, switching strategy? You see, I've mentioned derivation as well as uh, the final expression. So you can just put in this value and you'll be able to, this is a closed form of that equation. How do you select this inductor, okay? And how do you select this capacitor? Basically, it, it will come from your cutoff frequency requirement and you can easily select that also, okay? So I just gave an example also, putting some voltage, uh, power rating, etc. I gave you. And uh, yeah, this is regarding how do you select this your DC bus capacitor, okay? For this kind of application, yeah. it's a single phase inverter, 
how do you exactly decide this capacitor it also explained in terms of equations okay and if required i can share you the paper from where these are taken uh, this you have to just spend maybe 15 20 minutes right uh, and all these derivations are given finally this is the closed form equation sorry so what is it it is nothing but your solar maximum power how much for which you are designing this is that average value maybe 400 volt this is how much ripple you want you are you you are happy with let's say 10% of this and this is nothing but your grid frequency to pi f now derivation is again <laughs> it will take some time so i am not going into it if you uh, want this expression how it came and if you want this ppt just drop me drop a email to me i'll be happy to share okay okay and this already we okay. tested in hardware and software so it is pretty much working no problem yes Okay. And in fact, how do you calculate uh, losses in the switches? This closed form equation. How do you derive the utility expression for these switches? What is their loss? All these things you, you get from this uh, single slide. So let me know if you need. Huh? I'm sorry, I could not uh, yes, derive yes. it uh, now. I'll just give you the solution. No, 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 sir. <laughs> okay, sir. Thank okay. you. Okay. Any other Hello. question? Uh, sir. Yes. Uh, sir, uh, regarding voltage sensing, uh, mm -hmm. what I observed, uh, always the voltage divider circuit is uh, used uh, with the help of resistor and the voltage sensing happens, but it, it has noise. So how to eliminate that or uh, is it a good practice or we should have some other alternative for it? Okay. Okay, that's in fact is a very good question. See, this resistor divider solution is not at all uh, used in several applications. I'll, I'll just tell you an example with the system I was discussing. Uh, let me add to issue. Okay. This, I need a bigger diagram. This. Actually, in sensing arrangement, it is always better to put some sort of isolation. Okay. Uh, reason is that, so their simple voltage divider won't help you. I'll just quickly explain. Let's say this is your DSP. And these are your ADC input. How do you sense? You put a ground signal there, right? And you send, uh, maybe this is your input one, this is your input two. Now, let's say I want to sense this voltage. And so then if you use a resistor divider, what will do? You will connect three, four resistance here between these two. Uh, and you connect this point to ground and one of the resistance point to this input pin. And if you want to simultaneously sense the solar photovoltaics, what you'll do? Again, you would like to connect it to the ground pin. And this point through some resistance divider, maybe you will connect it here. If you do it, what actually you can see that this negative point and this, this point you are actually shorting through this ground pin of the DSP, isn't it? So in this kind of solution, you should never use a voltage divider because you need some sort of isolation. You cannot have same ground pin connecting to inverter output and inverter input, right? It will simply short circuit your system. That is one point. Another point is that, uh, so you, you should use it some sort of isolation. How do you improve uh, isolation? Uh, there are some commercial uh, voltage sensor available in the market that you can use. Or what we do, we use this voltage sensor, but voltage divider we use, some high value resistance we connect between these two point. One is this point, another is this point. Then we feed it to an op-amp. Op-amp has its own power supply, right? And since, see, now this op-amp output, which is having same ground pin as your ADC ground, and uh, the op-amp output, you will feed it to this input signals. Now, op-amp negative point, you can directly connect to the DSP ground because op-amp power supply and DSP power supply, they will have the same ground, no problem. And all this signal you're feeding to some mega ohm resistance. So in effect, you are implying a virtual isolation in the system. This is not a physical transformer kind of isolation, but you are sending all the signal through one mega ohm resistance plus an op amp, it will have an infinite impedance, right? 
ideal of them. Practical of op amp will have high impedance. So all the signal you are feeding to DSP through a very high impedance path. So effectively you are creating an isolation. So this is how a low cost system works. And this resistor will be hardly two, three rupees. This op amp can be hardly five, 10 rupees. And uh, this, this op amp, if you design it properly, it will be able to help you with noise elimination also, right? So this is what generally we follow in our hardwares. And if I want to do it in a commercial level, uh, I generally use a uh, commercial uh, voltage sensor available, which gives isolation, proper isolation. But most of the solution, this works pretty well. And if you want to more about it. So, sir. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Sir, uh, that means op amp will be uh, acting as a voltage follower circuit, no, sir? We have to, or we have to think it as a buffer, means the mode of op amp. It is just an amplifier. It's either inverting or non inverting amplifier. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, so that's so generally that isolation most, because. Uh, yes, please go ahead. So isolation is uh, necessary, no? Because I was like, I was not able to understand because with this also it was working. But then some today for the first time I realized like how the equivalent circuit is differing <clears throat> and the main purpose of um, actual isolation is not getting served with this. So right. definitely it has to have op amp circuit or some uh, some buffer is required. Now, for example, if you're sensing only PV voltage, let's say, then oh, this voltage divider will work good, right? You are not short circuiting other part of the inverter. So if your system is just a, let's say, buck converter, you want to send sense output and input voltage, they have already common ground. So your system will still work. But it is always advisable that you sense only the signal to a high impedance path. But then I, I'm, I'm sure your uh, half of the problem will get solved there only. Okay. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you so much. I got an idea more, now. Yeah. And if you have time, please go through this YouTube channel. I had an entire lecture on this uh, sense why isolation is required in driver circuit and sensing board. So if you have time, please go through that lecture. There I, I suggested some uh, basic sensing circuit also. I think uh, you, you will, you will uh, like that content. If time permits, please do visit that. Sure, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, I think it is more or less 4 to 30. So maybe we can wind up. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. One minute, sir. Yeah, please. So thank you for uh, accepting our invitation and discussing in detail all practical aspects for design of photovoltaic system. Explanation about implementation of DSP in hardware will be beneficial for us in the research work. It was really interactive and informative session, sir. So once again, we would like to express our gratitude to Professor Dipankar Devnath for conducting this session. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you so Thank you. much. Thank you so much. Yeah. yeah. In case uh, I'll be sharing this PPD, maybe I'll directly upload in the MS team if you wish. Uh, yes. yes. And later yes, on, sir. any any participants, if you uh, want to uh, talk to me regarding anything, if you have done or doubt, please feel free to write a mail. Okay, and yes, let sir. me just turn on the video for one or two minutes. I want mm -hmm. to I want to extend my heartly welcome uh, in the sense that if you happen to visit IIT Kharagpur or nearby area, please do visit our labs. We have a very good facility for electric vehicle, this kind of solar uh, study, etc. If you have some idea for collaboration or if you're interested to do any uh, similar collaborative work, please do write to me. Whenever situation uh, supports, please do visit us. And in fact, I also, I was actually, I was looking for a physical interaction as minimum already told that we are planning for a uh, offline. I was very happy, but hey, due to some uh, these issues, it could not happen. Maybe someday we'll meet in person and, and uh, we'll be able to work together also. With this, thank you very much again for attending this lecture and thank you very much the organizing team for giving me this opportunity. I thoroughly enjoyed. I think at least few participants would have got benefited and <laughs> hopefully, uh, yeah, you feel free to write to me whenever you uh, feel like. Yes, sir. Thank, thank, you. You. Thank, you, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. So I can take leave, right? Yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you.
So requesting all participants to tomorrow to join sharp at 9.15 so that we can start again.